I do the rest of the show, I come off, everybody, like my agents there, a couple of friends there, mate, I can't even hear them, right? Because I'm out of it. She was at rock bottom, man. And like, it's, you know, that was a low point. I've had many low points since. And some of those have been when externally, it looks like everything's great. And it really hammered home to me, the fact that people are really, really good at making it seem like they're okay. Welcome to Under the Surface. We're on a quest with Original Penguin and Calm, the campaign against living miserably, to uncover powerful and unheard stories of how people have overcome adversity and dealt with the stigma surrounding mental health. We'll hear from people from the worlds of music, sports, comedy, and everything in between, who despite having an incredible career in the public eye, are having their own personal battles in their private lives. Because you never know the full story of what's going on for someone under the surface. Warning, this podcast contains references to suicide and issues which some people may find distressing. Search Campaign Against Living Miserably for support and advice. Hello, welcome along to Series 3, Episode 1 of Under the Surface Podcast with myself, Adam Smith, and Marvin Sordell with Campaign Against Living Miserably and Original Penguin. Marvin, excited to say not only are we back for another series, but our first ever entertainment guest. Yeah, I mean... I'd like to think so. Yeah, and uh, this man, I mean, I, I don't know how long we've got for the intro. Comedian, he's a stand-up, an actor, TV star, podcast host, calm ambassador, BAFTA winner. It is the one and only Romesh Ranganathan. Romesh, have I missed anything out there? Because you are absolutely everywhere at the minute. Uh, diversity quota filler. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, congrats on Series 3. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, congrats it's the hardest, on BAFTA. Yeah, it's hardest. <laughs> Hardest thing to do is get more series of podcasts. So well done, guys. Yeah, great really to have you on. We, we do we do mean it. Um, great to have you on. I know you're an ambassador you. for Calm as well, which is very important. So yes. we're going to start as we always do. We're going to do it in chronological order, talking about there's there's so much to talk about with you and, and and how incredible your career has been and continues to do so. But I want to start by just going back to your childhood days and your relationship with your parents and and, and how that was for you growing up. My very early years were was up sort of very pretty textbook. Do you know what I mean? My dad was doing very well. My mum and dad. Were Seemed fairly happy. My dad was a bit of a, you know, the, like I get nervous about describing my dad because I love my dad a lot. And I, but he was like a bit of a loose cannon. Do you know what I mean? Like so, he was like a big drinker, heavy smoker, a bit of a like you know, like the ladies. Do you know what I mean? So he was a bit of a character. And like sort of most of my childhood was pretty happy. But the only thing I would say is is that, that I, I would see a lot of arguments between my mum and dad, you know, about my dad's behaviour and stuff like that. Because, you know, my mum and dad had come over from Sri Lanka pretty young. My dad had come over for, for a job. My mum came over to, to, because she'd married my dad, basically. You know, so she was like 19, 20 years old when she came over. So, you know, it was a difficult thing for her to do. Um, and so my early years were pretty, you know, pretty relaxed. We were doing all right. And then my dad... Unbeknownst to me, my dad had started, or unbeknownst to any of us really, my dad had started like messing up at work. He was getting drunk quite a lot. He was kind of like turning up like, you know, he was just, and so we ended up getting either being asked to leave or being fired or whatever. I don't know exactly what the, what the actual details were, but he started doing other things. He was like trying to do deals and stuff like that. And around the same, basically he was unable to keep up the mortgage payment. So we got to the situation where sort of almost as like a complete surprise, a house got repossessed. And then we kind of got, we were living in this house where that my dad was like, had managed to get off a mate, he was renting off a friend or whatever. And around that time, it started to become clear that financially he was in a lot of trouble. Like we were getting, it's, I'm laughing about it now, but it was like horrifying at the time. Like we'd get people that he owed money to, like coming to the door, we'd be like hiding under the table while like people were banging on the door asking where he was and stuff like that. Like it was mad. And then around that time, my mum discovered that my, uh, my dad had been uh, regularly seeing this other woman. And I think the plan was that he was going to try and set up a life with this woman and kind of leave my mum and us. And so my mum found that out while we were in this other house. And then um, sort of I remember like the, the real trigger point, the thing that really kind of sticks in my mind is like when the, you know, the real high point of the chaos was that my mum, basically we hadn't seen my dad for like two, three days. And my mum said to me, um, I, I don't know where your dad is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drive you and your brother to this woman's house, this woman that he's been seeing, and I want you to ask where dad is. I, I can't bring myself to talk to her. So can I take, I'm going to take you to this house. So me and my brother, like, went to the door of this woman's house, knocked on the door and said, like, where's my dad? 
And she said he was arrested two days ago. And it turns out that my dad had been involved in some sort of illegal import-export thing. There's kind of a fraud element to it. And he was the subject of this, like, police sting, got arrested in Leicester. And he ended up spending, like, two years in prison. And during that time, we couldn't be in that house anymore. So we ended up... The council didn't have enough housing. So we ended up living in a bed... My mum my and my brother and me ended up staying in this room with this bed and breakfast for, like... I can't remember how long it was. Like, it was a good few months. And then that was kind of, like... While my dad was inside, we were in this bed and breakfast, and then we kind of put into a council flat, got put into a council house. And then my dad came back out of prison, and my mum and dad kind of reconciled. I mean, I'm doing kind of a, a scattergun, potted history. But basically, the long and the short of it is, is it kind of was like very, very calm, yeah. and then everything sort of got turned upside down very, very quickly. And our whole trajectory changed from that. You know, my mum and dad... My mum lost all her friends, you know, because she was in a certain kind of group and then everything kind of went wrong. She didn't know what was going on with my dad. My dad went inside. And so, you know, we changed schools. And so, like, it was it was just a big flip, man. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think it was kind of a... It kind of felt, like, quite defining that period, you know? Like, I think that we would have ended up on a very different path had, had that all not happened. Yeah, yeah. So... And it affected my brother, it affected me, it affected my mum. I remember, like, you know, I, I would hear my mum cry herself to sleep every night in this bed and breakfast. We're in the same room, do you know what I mean? And she's like, you know, you think about it, she came over from Sri Lanka with her husband. She finds out that, he's, you know, he's been doing all sorts. Uh, the house gets taken away. And I remember her just, like, she was at rock bottom, man. And, like, yeah, I'd hear her just... I would hear her crying herself to sleep every single night. You know? What, what like, age were you at this point? Because that's a lot of... Yeah, information that, to deal with. Yeah. Your dad going to jail, the, the, the women that he was with, your yeah. mum, the, the mortgage payments. There's a lot to take in at a, a relatively young age, I'm presuming. Yeah, I think it started, like, all that stuff started to happen when I was about 11, and then it kind of carried on for the next few years. Do you know what I mean? It sort of, it kind of unwound over the next few years. But it felt super quick. Like, it felt like, yeah, it just sort of felt like everything turned to crap pretty swiftly. Do you know what I mean? Probably in that moment, you don't, as you said, it, it felt super quick and you probably didn't really process your emotions and stuff. But when you reflect looking back, do you feel a lot? Because I have a, in terms of my childhood, you know, I spent time in living in a bed and breakfast with my mum and my sister. I didn't grow up with my dad. And that period, when I look back, it doesn't, I don't really remember too much about how I felt. Do you look back and process it differently now to how you did at the time? Yeah, at the time, it's so weird because, like, even as I'm telling you the story now, it's like, you know, as you describe that, it sounds, it does sound horrible. I don't remember feeling this is horrible as I was going, oh, you just sort of go, I'm just, you know, you're just dealing with it as, it as it happens. I mean, like, do you know what? The sad thing is my main concern was my friends not finding out what was happening. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, that, really? was, that was my main concern. I just didn't want anybody to know what was going on. Like, I was just embarrassed of it, to be honest with you. And that was my main concern. That was almost what I channeled all my energy into. I just didn't want anybody to know that we were in a bed and breakfast, that, like, my dad was in prison. I didn't tell anybody. Didn't tell a I mean? single person? I think I told one mate, but everybody else, like, you know, like, the day my dad got, got put in prison, the next day was my birthday, and I went out and had a birthday with Matt. And, like, and people at your birthday party, no nobody knew. Because really? I, just, I just didn't want anybody to know. So I went and, like, we had, like, we went around to a mate's house and, like, watching films, having a bit of a party, and, like, not my dad, like, it was so weird. I, know, I knew my dad was about to spend two years in prison, but I just didn't want... I remember sitting with it. I remember, yeah. it, like, being conscious of it, but I just yeah. thought, I don't want anybody here to find this out. Do you know right. what I mean? So, um, but, you know, in answer to your question, yeah, it's, it's a weird... Certain things happen. Like, so, for example, we didn't have any money for food when we were living in the Ben and Breakfast, so we lived off micro... We had a microwave in the bottom of the thing, in the, like, underneath the table in the, in the Ben and Breakfast. And we lived off microwave cheese sandwiches, right? Like, that was, like, our staple diet. And, um, I mean, now I'm vegan now and I find cheese morally reprehensible. But if, if, ever, I eat, <laughs> if ever I eat a melted cheese sandwich from, like, like it, the, the nostalgia, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, you can't have it. It's just, like, it reminds me of that better breakfast. Like, it's, like, it's so vivid. Do you know what I mean? It just, yeah. I'm back. It's, like, uh, then it's little things like that. And also, the other thing is, it's, like, I know this sounds like such a cliche, but 
even like every now and again, if I'm on a holiday or something like that, you just have a moment where you go, I can't believe that. I can't believe my life. I'm all right. Do you know what I mean? I can't yeah. believe. Well, comparing this, where you are now. Yeah, to where yeah, you yeah. Were it's just yeah. like it felt like you don't even you don't have ambition at that stage. You don't have any aspirations. You don't have any. You're not thinking about hopes for the future. You're just thinking, I need to get through this. That's all you're thinking. All you're thinking is survival. And like you're thinking about how do I get through the next week? You don't think about, you're not thinking about what does this mean for my options going forward? What am I going to end up doing when I grow up? You don't care about any of that. You're just like, how do I get through this? And I went within myself. I became almost like mute. Do you know what I mean? Like I was really, yeah. I, was, I became really quiet. I didn't really chat very much to the point where people became concerned. Yeah. Like I remember overhearing one of my mum's friends saying to her, like, as Ramesh talks about this at all, he doesn't seem to be acknowledging what's going on or whatever, but, you know, different people process things in different yeah. ways, do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, that was your way of processing it at the time. And, like, when you got an older and you started to unpick it and unravel it, did you feel like that was just your way of processing and dealing with it? Or do you feel like it was just hard to deal with and you didn't want to face it? I think that there's... I, I think that is your way of processing it. I think you just kind of go... I think everybody responds to things in different ways. Do you know what I mean? And by the way, as I'm saying all this, I don't think what happened to me is the worst thing that's ever happened to anybody. But, the, the, you know, I know people go through much worse stuff than what we went through. But it feels, yeah. it, for, to us, it felt like horrific, you know? And so, and for me, it was just, I'm just going to kind of just deal with it silently, I guess, quietly, and just try and figure this out for myself. And also for a long time, you know, my dad was, a, I'm very much like how my dad was. Like my dad and I are identical personality wise. You know, he's a, he was like, he had the, we had the same sense of humor. He was the same kind of character. And for a long time, I refused to believe that he could do anything wrong. I saw him as like a hero. And so even when my mum told me this has happened and that's happened, I was just like, that can't, dad can't, really? that, dad can't yeah. have done that. Dad can't be seeing someone else. Dad can't have committed a crime. Dad, you know, this yeah. can't be the, and so when I did realize that my dad had done those things. It's like, you know, I think everybody has a moment, if you, with your parents or whoever you've got, there's a moment where you realize they're not infallible. Do you know what I mean? You realize you have a moment, an epiphany where you realize these people are just humans. Do you know what I mean? They're flawed. And I, I, I wasn't at that stage to accept that my dad was flawed. Do you know what I mean? Now, when I look back at my dad, he was deeply flawed. But I love my dad. You know, my, my memory of my dad is that I love him to bits. Like, he was a, he was a great guy. But he had issues, as we all do, do you know what I mean? On that period, you, you mentioned it there, in terms of your relationship with your father at that point, did, did that change when you, you, he went to jail, when he, there was things that you, you didn't know that he was doing? How did your relationship with your father um, change, or did it change at all at that period? It was, it was, when my dad was in prison, I was obviously just heartbroken that he was in prison and I wasn't seeing him. And, uh, yeah, I just found that. I was still kind of yearning to see my dad as much as possible because... Because also, you know, you've got to feel like I knew that my dad was thinking about going off with this other, fa this other woman. So then obviously there's a sense of rejection as a, as a kid. Do you know what I mean? Like, why did he want to walk away from us or whatever? That's, that's what you go through. Because my dad, the other thing is my dad never had this direct conversation. You know, marriage is split up. But what happens is, is that people sit down and go, this is what's happening and da 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 yeah. that, We didn't have any of that. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was just my mum going, your dad's done this. And my dad never really spoke directly about it to us. So I had no idea what his take on it was, you know. And so when he was in prison, I um, I just wanted to, you know, I was just really upset, wanted to see him. And, and then when the relationship took a downturn, I would say, in terms of my connection with my dad, it was after he came out of prison because my mum and dad... Uh, reconciled in a functional way like you know I think that looking back on it my mum wasn't ready to forgive my dad for all of the stuff that he'd done but she wanted to be with him but still hadn't got she hadn't really got closure on everything he'd, he'd done I remember like having a conversation with her like she would talk about what he'd done years afterwards and I go you got to, if, if this is how you feel you've got to split up like I'll support just split up with him do you know what I mean like because now you're going down the middle of the road you're with him but you you haven't accepted what's happened but I remember like when my dad had just come out of prison, um, I was I was off to uni, I was doing A-levels and I was off to uni. And I remember like a specific, this is like the specific moment where I'd come back from a night out. I'd been back, I'd come back to Crawley, gone out with some mates and just done a typical kind of bloke of that age thing of not letting my parents know when I was going to be back or whatever. And I came in kind of drunk or whatever. And then my dad said to me, 
what are you doing? Like, you've been so inconsiderate. And then I just, like, completely unloaded. I just really? was like, I just turned to him and I said, the idea that you can tell me what to do and you can come and parent me and tell me that I'm being inconsiderate. And I just, like, monologued at him. And, like, he just took it. He just sat there and took it. Like, my dad was pretty, you know, Sri Lankan culture is you respect your parents. Really, I was out of turn, to be honest with you. And my dad had... He didn't have a temper with us, really. But my dad was, like, pretty front-footed and... In any other circumstance, I'm sure my dad would have gone, how, you can't even yeah, begin what did he to, say you can't even, he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. He, wow. didn't say anything. Wow. he sat there in complete silence and like took it. And then I walked out of the house, like stormed off or whatever, did a dramatic kind of slam the door, slam it again to make sure everybody heard the <laughs> first time. I mean, I mean like wandered off for a bit. But I think that was like, my dad was kind of, I kind of feel like it was this horrible thing where I was saying the things that he thought of. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, I think that yeah, yeah. I wasn't saying anything that wasn't true. Yeah. But I guess that was probably the first time that I'd ever expressed to him how I felt about his actions. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And a lot of that was coloured by the fact that I'm his son and, like, you know, I'm, you're feeling that sense of rejection. It, you know, some of it might have been unfair. But it's the first time that we'd... I say we'd had a conversation. It was a one-sided conversation, but yeah. it was the first time that we'd ever really talked. You, you mentioned... Uh, going a bit older there, going to sort of university and going out and, and things like that. You've been very honest and open about your own mental health for yeah. many years. Am I right in thinking that's when your mental health was at its lowest at the sort of university stage? And if you don't mind me asking what the, the catalyst for that and, and why that particular period w was, was so difficult for you? When my dad went to prison and when all that stuff was going on, it was around the time I was doing my GCSEs and I, I sort of stopped caring about school and exams and stuff like that. And I went on to do A-levels. And I was like bunking off all the time. I didn't really apply myself. I kind of got into a bit of like, I was sort of smoking a lot of weed and I just wasn't into it at all. I just didn't really care. I, I wasn't invested in my own future at all. And so, and you know, but then what was hap what would happen is that I think I had like a, a bit of a realization when I got my, cause I did A levels and I just like didn't do very well because I didn't, I, I didn't work at all. And I just thought, I'll probably be, you know, I'll probably be all right. Yeah. I remember around the time of getting my A-levels, I think, like, I think I just started to get back to the idea of, like, what am I going to do with my life or, like, what are my options going to be? And I remember around the time of when I got my A-level results, I, I very seriously thought about, about ending my own life because I was just, like, I felt like... Um, I just felt like I'd been through the shit or we'd been through the shit. I didn't see... A, a bright future and then I got these A-level results which I deserved because I hadn't done any work it's not like I don't know what I was expecting I mean I'm not applied myself at all but for some reason I thought maybe some miracle yeah. you know I wanted something good and then when I got those results I was like what is the I know it sounds so crazy but I just sort of thought this is just another sign that nothing good you know like you just nothing good is going to come to you and then so when I go into uni and I wasn't applying myself at uni. I was sort of turning up and doing whatever. I, I, I sort of flirt, you know, I'd go through periods of going, I should probably do some work, but I'd, I'd, I wouldn't go to lectures. And I'd have periods of thinking I need to work. And like people I was around were working and that kind of made me work a bit. But anyway, I remember, I remember coming home from uni and I'd, I'd saved up and bought this like, I've always really been into my music and I bought this like really cool little kind of hi-fi unit thing. But I didn't want to take it to halls of residence because you can't trust people, do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so I left it at home. And then we had somebody staying around, like this guy that was this Sri Lankan friend of my parents who was like struggling. And so they let him stay at our, like, you know, they said you can stay with us until you get your, you know, find your feet or whatever. And he was just st staying in my bedroom. And like when I came back at the weekends, I was sharing, you know, I was, he, he'd be sleeping in my room. And I remember um, coming home and they'd moved my, they'd moved that hi-fi because he needed to put some stuff down or whatever. Mm. And I flipped out. Like I, I like really, I didn't flip out. I didn't get angry. I just like got really upset, like really upset that this thing had been moved. And I was like, just like, I'm not even welcome in my own house and blah, blah. Why is my stuff being moved? Da, da, da. And, and then I realized that this was an over, like I realized a little bit after, so that was a massive overreaction. And I thought, why have I overreacted like that? Like, that is not, I don't think this is rational. You know, I sort of thought, I'm not, I, this is not a rational response to what's happened. And I think that was the moment that I thought, I need to get some, I, I, I need to think about what's going on in my head here. Like, I became aware of it for the first time. And so when I went to, the next week I went to uni, I saw 
I mean, I can't remember whether it was by accident or I sought it out, but I saw that you could get like counselling and therapy at, at, at uni. So I signed myself up and started doing sessions from then, basically. I was going to ask that about, you said you had suicidal thoughts there. Um, obviously, with this, this podcast, a lot of our listeners and viewers, sadly, are going through a lot of difficult times. There will be people that, that might have. What, what advice would you have for people that might be thinking those thoughts? Because you're someone that, that has come out the other side, and obviously, you're living a very successful life now. So I just wonder what advice you'd have for people who might be in that place that you were once in. You know, the truth is, is what I found, my personal experience, and, and it's, it, it's happened since then, again, where I've thought about a, a, a taking my life. But what happens is, is, and, you know, the, it's the old cliche of this, it's, a, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem, you know. And, and I remember the reason I found it so almost enjoyable to think about is, like, You'd, I'd fantasize about it. I just think I'd fantasize about a time when I didn't feel like this and taking my life felt like the way to access that. Do you know what I mean? It felt like the way to achieve that. So I would think about it and I think about if I was gone and immediately a weight would feel like it's lifted off my shoulders. I feel like I don't have these problems anymore. Do you know what I mean? And that is really, it's tempting. You know, in, in those moments, there, there's no getting around it. It feels tempting. It feels like, this could be, this, this is a really instant way of making this go away. And, and so when anybody says they feel like that, and I don't care what the trigger is, you know, like there's a lot of people that think you have to be like absolutely rock bottom to feel like, I just don't, you can't be in people's, you don't know what they've gone through, you don't know what their mental circumstances are. You know, people can feel like that in any set of circumstances. Even like, you know, I could feel like that now. You know, you, you mentioned that I've got a successful career with it. I could still be, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, there's all these external things that are like validations for why you should feel happy that don't, they don't necessarily break through. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that you're, you're happy and satisfied in your core. And so what I found was like, you just have to do the thing you don't want to do which is talk to somebody or, f or seek some help. Because what then happens is you then look back on that, that time and you think, I can't believe I came close to doing that. You know, I can't believe. You look back, you, you just, you, you have to kind of, even though you don't want to, you have to know that you will feel better as a result of doing it. Even though it doesn't feel like that in the instant, it's like, I don't know, eating a lot of broccoli. Do you know what I mean? Like, like you, you, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to do that thing, but you will feel better as a result. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And and I think it's so difficult to get yourself to that point because you feel embarrassed. You feel because uh, the truth is, you know, I knew I wasn't going. For, you know, like you look at that on paper. Romesh thinks about ending his life after his A level results. I mean. It's, it's, it doesn't, do you know what I mean? It's like, what? And like, even in that period when I was at my lowest, the level of privilege I was experiencing, I was doing A-levels. Mm. I was like receiving a free education. Mm. This, I was housed, do you know what I mean? Like yeah, I, yeah. Was, I had enough to eat. So there's all these things that are like, I, I'm nowhere near rock bottom at that stage, but mentally I was. And that's why I just don't think you can, you don't know what somebody's going for. And, and so it, it feels, when you're in those moments, it, it feels it feels so tempting, man. And the truth is, it's like you've got to go. I'm not. You've got to understand. You will not feel like that forever. And by talking to somebody, anybody, whoever that might be, you get an access to try and uncover how you get you get out of feeling like that. Do you know what I mean? I think that's a really good point. I was just saying what what Romesh was saying there about not knowing what other people are going through, despite what you might see, especially on social media now, where people seem to post all the positives or you don't really know. People tend to post the holiday pictures, the cars, the house, the nice things, but you don't really know what, what's going on. And it's a theme we often have in the podcast, which is about talking. I just wondered, Marvin, is that something you can relate to? Because you speak very openly and honestly about suicide as well. Now. <laughs> yeah, I just no. wondered if what Romesh was saying, it, it, the emotions that he was experiencing is something you can relate to there. Yeah, I mean, it just it takes me back to many times, mm. many periods of my life, and I can just place myself in... In those, in those feelings, and those, you know, everything that was going on in my circumstance, and it was the same. Like when I was 21, I was the most privileged position I could ever be in, but yet I was at my rock bottom. See, everyone's rock bottom is completely different, and it's not circumstantial. It's not dependent on whatever you have. It's just how you're feeling inside. So yeah, I mean, I wonder 
is that something that came to you, that thought process of understanding to reach out and talk to someone? Did that come to you young? Because people go to therapy it, at different points in life. Obviously, you spoke about, you know, when you've, when you were diagnosed and you went to therapy for the first time. But as a young person, when you're still figuring yourself out and also figuring out your emotions, you don't necessarily know why you feel, how you feel, or even what you feel. Like to understand, right, I'm, I'm really not good. I need to go and speak to someone. Like how, do you, how did you process that at that age? I mean, like, you know, as I describe it now, it sounds like a much more sophisticated process than the actual reality of it. The reality of it was, is I just thought, I'm completely messed up. What can I do? You know, it wasn't like I thought, I didn't go thinking therapy is the answer. This will figure me out. And then I went on a, like, a load of things and thought, wow, I've developed a series of co coping strategies. That wasn't how it happened. What happened was I was just sat there going, I am messed up, man. What the hell do I do? I, I didn't want to talk to my girlfriend about it. I didn't want to talk to my friends about it. I certainly didn't want to talk to my mum and dad about it. And so you sort of go, well, what the hell do I do then? And so you just see this thing and you go, I don't know if this is going to work. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like I go, oh, that's the answer. I was like, oh, that is something. Let me just try that. And, you know, it could have been that I went to one and then I went, this ain't, this is like mm. not the thing. But it just so happened I went to that first session. I was like, I probably should carry on with this. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't like, you know, I, I wasn't like I... It just wasn't as smooth as that. It was just like I was desperate and I thought I need to do something and I can't talk to anybody around me. So let me just go and talk to someone else. Do you know what I mean? That's that's what happened. What would have happened if I hadn't have found that counselling or therapy useful? I don't know what my I don't know what I would have. I didn't know what the next what would. Be. I just tried it and it was helpful. Do you know what I mean? And I say helpful. I didn't come out of that and I'm like, cool. I've put that in a box now. I'm good to go. I mean, I went on to spend. I've gone on to spend many many years sort of dipping in and out of therapy and and having dark moments. You know. It's, you know, that was a low point. I've had many low points since, do you know what I mean? And and some of those have been when externally it looks like everything's great, yeah. do you know what I mean? So it's just you can't uh, you can't predict when that's going to hit you. I'll ask you about the stigma as well then, because we're talking about a period that was a, a little while ago and you're saying there that you want, didn't want to talk to partners and your, and, and your family. Do you think we've come... We're not, we're not there yet, of course not, but has it got better to what I imagine the stigma was associated with seeing a therapist... 10, 20 years ago compared to now? Was that a difficult thing to, to tell people you were doing at the time? Um, well, I mean, the, tr the honest truth is I kept it a secret. Alina, I didn't tell anybody. I said I was going, I think I said I was going to the gym. But then after I've been doing it for a few weeks and they noticed no discernible change in my body shape. <laughs> I think they, people start to become suspicious. But, you know, the, the, the honest truth is like, my, you know, Sri Lankan culture, my mum, I couldn't have told my mum that I was doing that because she would have just... I'm going to a therapist. Mm. It's not... There is a, there's, there's a stigma attached to that in terms of, you know, people, people didn't see mental health. I don't believe. People didn't see mental health as a real... It's, they don't, mental health is like a misnomer. Do you know what I mean? It's not a health thing. Health is your physical body. What's mental health? Do you know what I mean? And so saying to people that I'm going to a therapist or a counsellor or whatever you, you know, whatever it is, I just didn't feel like I could tell people. Whereas now, even, even men talking about their feelings is something that I'm, I, I think we've made so much progress. Yeah, in. I agree. And, and recognising mental health as a thing that needs to be acknowledged and dealt with and it's, it's something that you can openly talk about and if you're struggling with it, you can say. We've made so much progress with that since, you know, over the last 10, 15, 20 years. I, I think it's... We're worlds apart from it. I, I really do think we've made massive inroads. And getting to a point where uh, somebody can say to a friend, I'm just struggling in my head at the moment, that's not something I don't, I don't think even that long a time ago you'd feel comfortable saying to somebody, you know? And I think that we really have made pro progress in that regard. When you say you, you, you were going to the gym as a joke, but you were. Yeah, that's, that's yeah I mean, that yeah, is yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, the, that's the biggest thing, like, when it comes to health. Like, we see physical health, we understand that. Mm. But we talk about mental health and we don't necessarily think about it as, you know, therapy therapy and therapists are like personal trainers for your mind. Yeah, essentially. yeah. They, they allow you to get in shape and get your mind to a point where you can go and face whatever is in front of you, you know? Do you, do you relate to that, Marv, as a, as a calm ambassador as well, obviously, in terms of 
the conversation has improved <coughs> over over years compared to like when you were playing and obviously you've spoken about yeah. your mental health uh, struggles whilst you were playing. I, I feel like there's a long way to go, but it has come a long way since that period of time. Yeah, massively. I mean, the fact that three men are sat here yeah. <laughs> talking about mental health, you know, that's a massive thing. And when I was 21 and I was in that really dark place, you know, the club at the time, they found out and said, I need to focus on football. Wow. You know, and that's obviously I couldn't focus on football yeah, because my mind wasn't right. You know, so it's a, it just shows like how, how far we've come along. Obviously, we've still got a long way to go. But the fact that we can actually have this conversation and it's not a thing of just being dismissed straight away or shut down and we can actually start to unpick it and discuss it and, and then try to find coping mechanisms for people, you know, the progress is, is amazing. Romesh, how did you find balancing all that you went through um, in your childhood years and then university years to then building a career? You were a teacher before you were going to, as a comic, is that right? You're working yeah. as a teacher, but obviously yeah. you've got a lot to deal with, but you're trying to make a profession where, where you make people laugh ultimately. So, so yeah. how, how was that balance at that time? I was, I was, t I mean, I really loved teaching. I did yeah. teach for a long time and I became like a head of sixth form and I really did find that job rewarding. Um, and then I sort of fell into comedy by accident. And then so I was sort of gigging in the evenings after school. So I'd often like, I'd finish school, jump in the car, head off to a club or whatever. And I was trying out and trying to make my way through it. And then eventually it got to a point where somebody said to me, oh, you could do this as a career. Mm -hmm. And so then from then on, I, I tried to make it as a, you know, I started thinking, let me try and see what, what might happen now. I didn't have any kind of aspirations or anything like that. I just thought, let me just see if I can be a comedian. But I was loving teaching, so it wasn't like, I just thought if this goes, if this doesn't work out, I'll, I'll spend the rest of my life as a teacher. Yeah. You know, I'll be, ha I'll be happy with that. Um, it was, I don't know, man. I, I, I think that the truth is you struggle, if you've got mental health issues or you've got things that you're trying to cope with, you're going to have that whatever you do, you know, whatever job you choose yeah. to do. And I really love teaching and I really love comedy. So why don't I do things I really, you know, that's what I felt like. I felt like, let me really do things I really love. And I think part of the reason that I was pushed towards that is that on my, I saw my dad be driven almost purely by, towards financial gain. Yeah. And I saw what that did to him. So I just thought to myself, I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm gonna do stuff that I actually wanna do. And the finance can be like a secondary kind of target for me. Let me just kind of um, do what I wanna do and see what happens. But. You know, in answer to your question, being a comedian, and I think more now being a public figure, I think you do have to be mentally and emotionally robust to kind of be under that level of scrutiny. I yeah. mean, I think that, I mean, I, I personally, I think footballers have got it worse than anybody else yeah. in that. Well, I, I kind of- In terms of social media you're talking about? I think social media is yeah. like, you know, you mentioned social media earlier <clears throat> and this whole obsession with presenting a yeah. positive outlook. Yeah. I really would like a culture where people start posting up about when things have gone shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I, I do think this whole thing of like, this whole thing about putting out a positive out a positive thing of what your where your life is at. I don't. I'm not convinced that's entirely useful. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I get why you do it. I mean, I've done it, mate. Do you know what I mean? But, but, <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's kind of. I, I do think this kind of getting around that and getting into a thing of where, of where we're actually being a bit more real, I Realistic, guess, about what's yeah, going yeah. on. And actually people, you know, I don't think there's anything nicer than seeing somebody who you really respect saying they've had a dreadful day mm. or something's gone wrong. I love posting about how I've absolutely died on my ass at a gig. I mean, it's like, good, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but I, I do think that I thought that, I remember when I first did, for example, I did Russell Howe's Good News. That was my yeah. first kind of big TV spot. And I remember, I didn't watch it because I'd never watch anything I did, but I was, I was just sitting in front of the TV watching something else. My wife didn't ask to watch it either. And, 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 and like the, the, the set went out and like on Twitter, I just suddenly got like, oh, oh this is really good. Yeah. Oh, who's this guy? And I heard of this guy. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. And then suddenly I got, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh my God, why have they got this? And then I was like, oh my God, it's like my first realization yeah. that, that you can get negative stuff come off of this. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, I started scrolling. It was like, I'm going to be honest with you, 50-50 yeah. in terms of... In terms of <laughs> On Twitter, shit. that's good. Absolutely nailed it. <laughs> but then, like, you know, the, the, I, I, I would say every day... Yeah. I'm not exaggerating. Every day I get somebody tell me they hate me on social media. Every or why, day? I would... Yeah, that's... Wow. I'm not exactly Like, definitely at least one. Somebody saying, why can't you disappear off to... Or whatever. 
And I think you just have to you just have to desensitize yourself to that. Yeah. You know, I think you have to desensitize you, desensitize yourself to that, but you also have to desensitize yourself to people saying that you're really good. You know, like sometimes right. people come and watch me live yeah. and they go, that's the best comedy show I've ever seen. And I think you need to watch more comedy. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's absolutely no way that's the best comedy show. <laughs> so like and but then so I thought we had it, I thought comedians had it bad or TV persons had it bad. And then from doing League of Their Own and like getting to know footballers and stuff yeah. like that, like somebody will post uh, great day in training today. Mm. And then the first 30 comments would be like, get out of my club. <laughs> you need to train harder. What are you doing? <laughs> what were you doing today? You absolute scum. What the heck? Like, just like yeah. nonstop. Yeah. I was like, how do you deal with that? Mm. I've, got, I've got no idea. Mm. You know, like even like the guys that do, you know, and I've had it happen relatively gradually. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Like yeah. over the course of like a few years as I've done more TV, yeah. like my profile's increased. I sometimes think these people that do reality TV and they go from being completely unknown to everybody having an opinion on them. Yeah, and suddenly millions of followers and how, how you I, deal with I that. don't even know how you prepare somebody. I've got no idea what you have to put in place mm. for that person to be protected from the effects of that because I found it difficult and it's mm. happened to me relatively slowly. Do you know yeah. what I, mean? I mean, don't get me wrong, I've smashed it pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty quick rise to stardom. But what I mean is like, it's happened over a few years Whereas like for some people, it happens instantly. You're a footballer, mm. you get signed for a, a club, and then next day, so many people know about it. I don't know, like, yeah. what do you do? Like, I don't, think we're re- I don't think we've been ready for the effects of no. social media. Do you know what I mean? And so, so anyway, this is a very waffly answer to your question. But the, the thing is, I do think being in the public eye, you have to be prepared to go, I distance myself from, from what you're... I mean, I came off Twitter like two years ago because yeah. it's just, I just found it poisonous. And like, I don't think it is good for you to know what people think about you, positive or negative. Mm. I, I don't think that having a, that being a direct stream to your brain is good. Well, that many people anyway. No, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you said about desensitizing, but that's, I mean, you just said that it's almost impossible to do that, isn't it? If there's that many people critiquing you on a daily basis, how, how do you desensitize yourself to that? Where you place validation, isn't it? Mm. I think if you place validation externally, you're always going to be seeking that positive comment but within that, you're still going to look for negative. You're going to, like, it's, it's strange because you, you can find yourself engrossed in this thing where you're, even if every single comment is, is amazing, you're looking for that one because you want every single person to say you're amazing if you, get, if you get kind of stuck in that cycle. And so there's always one, you know. They might not even watch, you know, from playing football, someone might not even watch the game. They just saw, we lost, I didn't score. I could have had the best game of my life. And they'll say, oh, you played terrible. Yeah, yeah. Like, but you never even watched. Yeah. I don't know that, but they may never have watched. And so Well, you catastrophize what that comment is. Yeah. Like, you know, when you're when you read all these comments, like if I have a show come out or whatever, mm. like I would love it if my job was making the show and then it just gets put in a vault somewhere. Like like when it gets put out, that's the most anxious I am. Because you sort of think I've put so much of myself yeah. into this. And now people are gonna judge it, and some people are gonna go, This is awful. And that's really hard. But like you have to kind of, what happens is, is you read all these good comments and something in your brain goes, oh, they don't really know what they're talking about. They don't really know what they're talking about. And then somebody goes, this is awful. And you go, that must be a comedy expert. Yeah. Oh, that person yeah, really yeah, knows yeah. what they're talking about. Yeah. You know, like it's horrendous. And like, we have this thing called comedian's eye where if, you, um, if you're doing a gig yeah. and you're having a great gig, but one person isn't laughing, that is the only person you can see. Wow. It's just, it's just like this thing, like you can't help it. And the truth is you can't do anything about it. If they... If they don't find you funny, what do I do? Yeah. I can't suddenly break dance. Like this is the, <laughs> the, like this is the act. Do you know what I mean? It'd be a good plan B though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. But I remember like you just get used to it. You just yeah. go. I, my job is not to make everybody like me. I don't want everyone to like. I don't want to be so vanilla yeah. that everybody likes me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I remember like doing. I remember doing. Well, actually, I had two examples of gigs where I had completely different responses. Right. I um, I was doing the Apollo. It was like my first run of doing shows at the Apollo. Yeah, like, it's like proper Apollo. dream yeah. come true. Oh my God, my shows at the, the Apollo. It's an iconic venue. And I, like an idiot, in the interval, I looked on Twitter, right? And there was. Yeah, a, sorry, in the interval. In the interval, wow. right? What a. I mean, so <laughs> stupid, so incredibly stupid. I can tell by your body language, you're still angry about that now. So I'm like, so angry with myself. Like half time, just coming yeah. in and like, yeah. how did I play first half? <laughs> <I know. laughs> why would you? Why would you expose yourself to that? The second half, yeah. So stupid. Anyway, somebody goes at at the interval of oh, Romesh Ranga's show, hate it, blah blah. I mean, I deserve that. I shouldn't. I shouldn't have looked. Anyway, I go out to do the second half. 
mate, I'm not even in my body. Like, really? I just am... Because of that comment? Because of that comment. Really? I go out, I do the second half. Now, bearing in mind, I've wanted to play the Apollo yeah. for however long. I'm doing a run at the Apollo. I should be absolutely buzzing. Yeah. One comment, second half ruined. I'm doing the show, like, I'm doing the show, nobody can tell, in my head, there's that guy who hates you. There's probably a few other people that feel like that. Mate, this is, like, mad. Why can't you... You need to start improving. Like, why can't you... You don't deserve to be doing the Apollo. Like, all of that's going through my head. I do the rest of the show, I come off, every, like my agent's there, a couple of friends are there, mate, I, I can't even hear them, right, because I'm out of it. There's like a bar afterwards, and I walk into the bar, and it was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't, it ruined, it ruined it for me, right, I was just like out of it, I can't, and it took me like the next day to just rationalise that, and, well, first thing, don't look in the interval, but, but to, to sort of rationalise that, and then on my, the tour after that, I was doing a show in Edinburgh and it was a great show. I had a great time, really went well. And um, after the show, I didn't look in the interval. After the show, <laughs> I was just looking on social media and like there's loads of nice comments. And then one guy said, um, hated it, left at the interval, right? So, but the difference is I knew that that was a great show. Like I knew yeah, okay. that I'd had a good show yeah. and I could tell by the audience response, I could tell by the other, I just knew that I'd had a good one. So it just didn't have any effect on me. And I remember thinking like, well, like that felt like a, yeah. a good thing. Do you know what I mean? Because I went from like absolutely spiraling yeah. to just being, okay, well, I'm not for everyone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've still got the ticket money. Yeah. You don't get a refund if you don't like it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So. <laughs> That's a very good point, though. I've seen you say in the past, though, and so many other comics have said that. Every comic, no matter how good they are, will have a gig that it doesn't go to plan. Or, yeah. or It happens to everyone. So yeah. Yeah, at that period when you're you're leaving university, you leave, you, I imagine you've just said you, you love teaching, but when you realised it was becoming a career path, and obviously financially, I, I presume it's at the early ages of being a comedian, very competitive, and I imagine very tough because you've got to finance a lot of it yourself is that something there must be so much to balance as, as an upcoming comedian as well as all the heckling yeah I had a tough time of it well, every, to be honest with you anybody going to do something like that will have a tough time mm. of it right because it doesn't pay like when no. you when you start doing comedy how it works is I know this isn't a, a podcast about the process of becoming a comedian but how it works is you go and try out for nothing yeah. and then if they like you they'll pay you to do a weekend so you'll try I'll be driving to Birmingham for nothing, wow. to go and do 10 minutes, and then if they want you, they'll go, you come back and do a weekend. So you're, you're just trying out. And I was doing that after school while I was teaching, and we were just about to, uh, we just had our first child. And um, and then what happened was, is I, I got an agent, and they said, you're gonna have to, um, you're gonna have to quit your job. Like, you can't be a comedian, you're not gonna be able to do as much as you can possibly do with a comedian, as a comedian while you've got your teaching job. And so I was like, okay, I need to, I need to quit my teacher job. And I handed in my notice, and then like three days before uh, I was due to finish teaching, my dad passed away of a heart attack suddenly. And so we had to deal with that. Like it turned out, my dad's finances were a house of cards. So the, for the first period of me being a full time comedian, I just wasn't in the game. Do you know what I mean? Because I was trying to figure out what to do about that, and I no longer had a teaching salary coming in, and. Um, there's a lot to process there because, you know, I plunged my wife and I into sort of a real struggle mm. and not for a noble reason. Do you know what I mean, I was, all, I was doing all right as a teacher and yeah. then I've gone, I think my job should be saying what I think and being paid for it. I mean, it's such a selfish thing, <laughs> narcissistic thing to do. And then as a result of that, we're in trouble. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. that, that you deal as a... As somebody that's trying to do the right thing by my family, I struggled with that, to be honest with you. You know, like, it was a difficult thing. And, and so the number of times I thought about giving up comedy, so, yeah. like so many times, yeah. Really? Uh, so many times. I remember, like, uh, I was doing this uh, comedy competition and I'd just done, a, like, a corporate gig the night before. And I think it was in Glasgow. And then I was taking a train to Leicester to do this competition. And we were just broke, like we were just struggling. Like we'd had our, our car had been impounded. We're struggling to pay the bills. And I remember phoning my wife and I said, like, I can't do, I, I don't want to, I can't do this anymore. This is like, I can't keep doing this. I don't know why I'm going to this competition. I don't know why I'm doing any of this. 
And she said, go, why don't you go and do the competition and then come home and let's have a chat about it, right? And I said, okay. So I went to the competition. Like I got the train to Leicester just thinking, I am going to go home from this and have a serious think about what I'm going to do because this is awful. And um, I love doing comedy, but I just thought, I don't love doing comedy so much yeah. that I'm willing to put my family at risk for it, which I already had done, to be fair. But, um, and then I won the competition. And like, I don't know if it's because I just felt liberated from yeah. just like, I'm going to go and be a maths teacher after this, so whatever. But um, it felt like I just, it just gave me another, I don't know, six months. Like in, like in my head, I just went, oh, maybe I should just try. And I remember like phoning my wife afterwards and she went, I think let's just see, let's just see, let's just give it a new, another few months. You can go part-time if you want and blah, blah, blah. But I really was, I did go to that being convinced I was going to quit that night. Do you know what I mean? I was, that was going to be my last gig. Well, not my last gig, but my last gig at trying to be a comedian. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Rob, I just wanted to ask you about your link between sort of mental health and sort of comedy. Uh, I've heard you previously say you think a lot of comedians are slightly different and a lot of them might have issues to, to want to do com comedy. Have you always found that as a sort of coping mechanism, if you like, to, w with issues that you have had with your mental health? Is there a correlation there at all? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, uh, my personal feeling is comedians are slightly... They're just wired slightly differently, I think, or, or something's happened that's changed their, their way of looking at things because... You know, that is the job of a comedian, I guess, is to find things that... It will look at things in a way that other people wouldn't look at, maybe. But I do think that, you know... I use... Everybody, to a certain degree, uses humour as a coping mechanism. And I, I think that's a fair thing to say. And I, I do it all the time. And, you know, for example, I grew up getting bullied because of my lazy eye. And now it's one of the things that I sort of joke about them. And it's almost like you want to get there first. Do you know what I mean? You, want, you know, you can't say anything that I haven't already said about this. Do you know what I mean? And, but sometimes you can use it to kind of deflect. And I, and I think that's something that it's worth being aware of. I mean, I, I've got to be honest with you. I, I think it can be really useful. Like, I have a very dark sense. Like, my family have got a very dark sense of humour. Like, for example, when my dad passed away, so my brother... My brother found, he came home and found my dad sort of collapsed. And that was the, you know, that was my dad had had a heart attack and passed away. And we got it all sorted out. And I turned up and immediately started, uh, immediately started crying. And the next day, or maybe two days later, we were around my mum's house and we were sort of dealing with the, the, the aftermath of that and people coming around. And then my brother subjected me to a 10 minute roast about the sounds I make when I cry. Uh, and we started, like, we were properly laughing about it. Like, he goes, goes, listen, man, he goes, we've got to talk about some of the sounds you were making. Like, it was mad. I've never <laughs> heard noises like that come out of a person. And then, like, we just, and we started laughing about yeah. it. And it was like, I know it sounds, like, super dark, but it was almost, that was like, uh, it felt cathartic. Do you know what I mean? We were like, we're going through this horrible thing, but you can still find light in it. You can still have, you know, we can still joke and we still... So I think in those ways, humour can be... And, and also, equally, I talk about my mental health, you know, my mental health on stage. And I think... And I talk about, you know, I could talk about all sorts of things on stage. I talk, you know, you can talk about issues of race, you can talk about issues of homophobia, whatever you want to talk about. But I think by making jokes about it, you can bring it into the, the conversation. I mean, I talk about mental health very openly in my stand-up. And what and I don't do it, I do it because I found funny things to say about it. I wouldn't say that I'm a, I'm doing it for any other reason. But the hope is, is that by normalizing chatting about it, it becomes like a thing that, you know, the staple of uh getting a a, a prostate exam from a doctor is like a, that's like a comedian. Like, like so many comedians have talked about that over the years. Why are we not why is like going and having therapy, why is that not a staple of like of stand-up? Do you know what I mean? That should be something we're talking about as openly, do you know what I mean? And and, and as readily. So I think that there's like a double-edged sword to it. I think in some ways humour is a great coping mechanism, but in other ways, on the other side of that, is somebody using humour as a coping mechanism because there's something else going on, do you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, it's something to be aware of. You mentioned, um, you've spoken a lot about grief and you mentioned your dad's passing there. Um, yeah. If you don't mind me asking, I know it must have been an incredibly difficult time, but I've, I've seen you talk about it in, with your work with Calm uh, in the past and obviously a lot of our, our viewers, uh, grief is something a lot of our viewers and listeners struggle with. 
How difficult was that period? And, and obviously you spoke about your father being someone you had a great relationship with. So again, at a time when you're trying to make it as a comedian, it must have just been j just such a, a challenge and a difficult moment for you in, in that period of your life. Yeah, it was like, it's kind of, it was, it was really hard because um, I was really close to my dad. And also our relationship had kind of declined and then we got closer than we'd ever been as, as just before he passed away. And he was in, like really supportive of my comedy. Like he used to come to gigs all the time. I mean, get completely bad every time, but he would come to every gig. And I remember like, I think it was two weeks before he passed away, I was doing a gig and it was like a big, not a big gig, but it was like a gig that I'd wanted to do for a long time and I was hosting it. And my dad got drunk and he was like chatting to all the comedians, he went to the pub afterwards and he was like chatting to all the comedians and he was being quite life and soul. My dad was like pretty much put himself at the center of any kind of social occasion. So he was like playing the room and chatting to the comedians and stuff like that. And um, as we were walking back to the car, um, he just goes to me, I, I wasn't embarrassing tonight, was I? And I said, no, no, you're fun, like you're hilarious, man. Like, don't worry about it. And he goes, I just don't ever want to be embarrassing. And he never, ever said anything like that to me. And that's the last time he ever came to see me live. It was just such a, it was such a weird thing. Like, I don't know, man, it was such a weird, one of my last conversations I ever had with him, really. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was such a weird thing. And it, it was really hard because I disco we discovered that we discovered that he was like, his finances were a nightmare. And so we had to kind of make sure my mum was looked after. So you sort of slightly irritated with him for that situation. But also the fact that, you know, now as it, as it carries on, like my dad has never really seen me, you know, he, he passed away three days before I even went full time. So one of the things that I always feel sad about is that my dad never saw me become a comedian really. Um, but it was, it, was, it was really hard. I remember on one occasion, you know, I'm an Arsenal fan, and my dad was like a proper hardcore Arsenal fan. And um, sorry, man. <laughs> I and, know, um, yeah. And um, <laughs> get the fact of his first value. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I remember something happened, like we were going in for a player, and then I went to pull my fan out and text him, go to go. What do you think about? And then I remember that he passed away. Like I, I just was like, because I always used to text him and talk to him about Arsenal and. Like, you know, you have all those moments where it's, it's, it's grief is tricky, you know, because you have this idea of what grief is supposed to look like, but it looks different for other people. Like, to be honest with you, I still, you know, at the moment, one of the things that I'm going through with my dad is sometimes I feel guilty about the fact I haven't thought about him for a while, you know, like where your life carries on. And I just in the last few years, I've started to forget what he sounded like, you know, and all of those things, there's all these different stages of, 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 of that kind of process. And it just is what it is. But, you know, trying to look after my mum, it was difficult. I was trying to sort out my mum's situation and I was worried about paying the bills mm. at home. You just feel like you're doing all those things terribly. And the person, one of the people that you'd go to for advice is no longer with you. You know, it was, it was, it was really, really hard. And you just sort of feel kind of lonely. A lot of pressure to take on your shoulders. Yeah, yeah, I th yeah, it is, and I, and I've got to be honest with you. In hindsight, I probably didn't handle it that well. It's just, um, it's just tricky. I feel like I, I was I was trying to do the right thing by my mum. I was trying to do the right thing by my wife. I, like my brother and I, my brother took a lot of that on his shoulders, like sorting everything out after my dad passed away, and and that was, you know, there's lots of kind of. It's just a lot of people going through a lot of stuff. Yeah. And on top of that, I'm trying to start a comedy career. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it was just a lot, you know? A lot to take on. Yeah. yeah. And I know that you speak with, with, with your, well, with Calm, um, suicide, something that, that you talk a lot about, and you recently had a friend that, that passed away with suicide. Do those moments, is, does this, why you want to talk and help these charities and talk about mental health? Because there are a lot of people that sadly do suffer in silence. Yeah, well, the thing with my friend is, it was a guy that I used to teach with. Um, and he's a really good friend of mine. And when I started doing stand up, he'd drive me to all my gigs. He was like really supportive. And we'd often like finish school and then he'd take me, like he'd drive me and come watch me. I mean, he saw me like die on my ass more than anybody else, I think, probably even more than my wife. But, um, and then what happened was is that he had, a, he had a difficult, I went off to do comedy, I left teaching, I started doing comedy full time. We still kept in touch. And then the thing that really got to me about the whole thing, to be honest with you, and the thing that made me want to work with somebody and it ended up being calm, 
um, is that he went through a really difficult time. He ended up leaving the teaching profession and it was like a horrible time for him. Um, and we all rallied round. He had like quite a few friends and we all rallied round and we were all very supportive. And we were trying to get him through it because we were worried about him and concerned and hoping he was going to be all right. And then he went to the next, he went through that, he got through that period and he was like talking very positively and he was like talking about what he was going to do next with his life. And I remember a few weeks before um, uh, he took his life, I went to dinner with him and um, I was actually talking about it yesterday because I went to lunch at the place that I had dinner with him and I like, we're sat at the same table, it's got me thinking about it. But he, um, he was talking, so, like when I had dinner with him, he's talking so positively about what he was going to do and he's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about moving into this area and da da da. And we were making plans about like meeting up next time we're going to meet up and da da da. He's going to come to a gig. And then I went and did a travel show in Ethiopia and we were staying on this campsite for a couple of nights and so I was completely out of contact. And we had a, we had a satellite phone or whatever, but essentially we were off grid. Yeah. And we were, we'd done a couple of nights and we were driving to this hotel and then suddenly all of our phones pinged up. Everybody suddenly got, got signal again. And my phone just started blowing up, just going, I can't believe what's happened to Mark. I can't believe the news about Mark. And it just because Mark wasn't in my list of people that I think that was, that was good. You know, like yeah. I'd just seen him be really happy and talk about the future. And I saw, I can't believe Mark, this has happened to Mark. Da, da, da. And it took me a while to piece together what was going on. And then eventually I phoned one of one of our uh, mutual friends and he sort of told me the whole thing. And we couldn't believe, we, 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 I remember having a long conversation about that it, it, it can't be serious, it can't, that can't be what it is because Mark didn't seem like the sort of person that would do, you know, like he was in such a different place. And so anyway, it turns out that is what, that is what happened and he was dealing with a lot of stuff that he was obviously keeping to himself. And that was the thing, to be honest with you, that scared me the most. Because I just thought he was presenting like somebody who was over that and was through to a very positive time. And it really hammered home to me the fact that people are really, really good at making it seem like they're OK. I mean, it's like because they feel like that's what they need to do. And so that's what he felt like he needed to do is project this thing. And, this, and it was heartbreaking to me that somebody that I consider to be a, a, a really close friend was going through all of this stuff and came to dinner with me and we were like joking around and like having a laugh and blah, blah, blah. Obviously that, in the right circumstances, that is the right thing to do. But I didn't know the context of, of what that was happening. He was going through it. And so that is kind of the reason where I felt, that, that, that is kind of one of the reasons why I, I felt like I wanted to do something to kind of, because the truth is, selfishly, you look at what you could have done, you know, and, and you sort of think, should I have done more for him? Could I have reached out to him more? And the answer is probably yes. Do you know what I mean? And so if you can do anything, I thought to myself, if I can do anything to sort of encourage people to look out for people like that, or not look out for people like that, it's not look out for people like that, look out for everybody. Do you know what I mean? Touch base with people. Ask somebody if they're all right, but it's not a functional conversation yeah. starter. You are actually asking if that person's all right. Looking for signs that people aren't all right. You know, all of those things, I think we get to a point where that's being done more regularly. I think we're in a better place, and that's the reason I kind of got involved with, with, with Calm, really. Yeah, well said. I think that's it's such a sad story, that. And tragically, it's what we hear a lot of, isn't it, with suicide, that those around them have often said, we thought everything was all right, or they didn't say anything. It's, it's a theme that we seem to hear, and it's, it's so sad that then you're talking about a loss of life when people don't know something's going wrong in many occasions. Yeah, I mean, it's something that... You know, when you're battling that, you, you feel that within you, you can hide very easily. You can hide very easily from everyone. It's easy to just kind of put this mask up and, you know, when you leave the house and you might be feeling so down and depressed and feel very dark and you just walk out and just find a way to just, like, get through it. You know, you kind of do the bare minimum. You show up and you kind of, you know, you collect all your energy. If it's, you know, dinner with a friend, you're like, oh, I just need to make sure that they, they don't, you know worry too much essentially and you always that's the I think that's the biggest thing you always think I don't want to put my problems onto someone else mm. you know and yet we understand now when we speak and we know that when we share our problems it makes it so much easier to deal with mm. you know we go through all individually we go through so many different things 
that, you know, that it's just a normal thing. It's a normal thing to discuss how we feel because, you know, everyone has their issues that they're going through. Mm-hmm. And yet, something that I always think about when I think back to, to the time and then where I am today, it's like, you always think you're the only one. You always think you're the only one that's that's ever felt how you feel or thinks what you think about, you know, in terms of dark thoughts and you feel like nobody else is going to be able to relate, to understand, or to be able to really support you or help you. And you don't really want to put your problems onto someone else. I think that's such a big thing when it comes to, you know, this subject matter. It's, it's we talk about like we should reach out and we should talk, but you know, I think being on the receiving end, being able to be open enough to to take that in. So like like you said, like asking someone how are you. Some sometimes people ask how are you. And their mind's already gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, they're like, yeah, yeah. it's a default you know, question, it, isn't it? Yeah, I'm alright. Like, right. yeah. Of course, he's gonna say he's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, it's kind of slowing down almost and being present and saying, okay, how are you? Yeah, you know, yeah. You think there's an issue, particularly with young young men, Romesh, that you know we look at the statistics. It's so sad the, the amount of young men that do take their lives. Do you think there is a stigma attached with with men opening up? Because it, it used to be people used to say it used to be perceived as a weakness. But I look at being able to talk and, and being honest with your friends as, as a real strength. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, my take on it, it might not be right, but I think individual men have become better at, at talking to people about their feelings and, and receiving people talking about their feelings. And my friends as individuals are great for talking to. My friends as a group, it's just, it's just different vibe. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think groups of men, we still have this thing where your conversations can't be about that. You know, like your, and I think it's getting better, yeah. but I think it's much easier if I've got a problem, if I talk to, I know that any one of my individual friends I could have a chat with and I could open up to and they'd be absolutely receptive and responsive. If I'm out at the pub with a group of friends, to make that, you know, a group of male friends, to make that start of a conversation about, you know, how are you really feeling? Mm. I don't think even as much progress as we've made I don't think that is something that we've got to yet. Do you know what I mean? I think that the the culture is a little bit like, you know, you talk about superficial stuff. Do you know what I mean? You don't, you know, the, 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 part of the culture of blokes is to just rip each other to shreds. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like the direct opposite. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, so how can you have this thing where you feel like, well, actually, I've not been feeling all right. Oh, my yeah. God, you heard this bloke. <laughs> Everyone pile yeah. in. Do you yeah. know what I mean? That's kind of like the thing, you know, I, I've been... I've suffered 40 minutes of like negative banter because I went to the toilet too frequently <laughs> the last time around. In a group of friends, yeah, in a yeah. group of mates. So you think I'm gonna like suddenly start opening up? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I think that thing is like it's a bit of a cultural thing, you know. I think that I think that men have become better at talking about that sort of stuff. But I think groups of men, I think it's still I, st- I still think there's a, there's an issue there to be honest with you. On that as well, just quickly, how how do we change that? Do you think it's a very difficult question? I know, but we have come a long way. Conversations like this help, but how do we change that? Do you think? Uh, I, I think the truth is you you have to accept that that is not going to be an, that you're not going to have an immediate fix to that. You know, I think that people, you know, younger generations. I look at my children. My eldest son's a teenager now. I look at the way that he talks to his friends, and they still have that kind of ribbing each other and all that kind of stuff. But I do feel like they're better. They're, he's more aware of mental health issues, and or not mental health issues, but even just the concept of mental health, he's more aware of than I was at his age. And I think that's something that's going to improve as time goes on. But you think about the the, the progress we've made with men talking about mental... You know, think about... We've just talked about it today, about how much progress we've made. I think that... I don't think it's something that can be sorted out immediately, but I think it's something that gradually... I think it's a cultural shift where it is something that gradually you can kind of change what the expectations are. There are certain things that blokes would say in conversation that now if one of your mates said that in conversation, you'd, you'd, you'd write quite rightly pull them up for it. And I think that's a, and that's a cultural thing. That's the thing where people would be more made, you know, be made to be more aware about how we should be conducting ourselves. And I think that if you have a situation where people are aware that this is something that can be, that, that, that people can go through, and that is something that we should be talking about, then I think gradually you'll start to see that change. But it's not its not going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. No, well said. Romesh, I've got to say, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on the podcast. Thank you for coming on First Entertainment Guest. No also, worries, man. thank you for being so honest and uh, with, with, with everything you've been through. I think it's going to help so many people. So I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, just quickly, what's next for you? Because you are everywhere at the minute. What have you got coming up? We're doing a new series of Robin Romesh Verses. I'm in the middle brilliant. of that. 
Uh, and then I'm just writing a new tour. I, I was, I think I was saying to you before we started, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm selling tickets for a show that doesn't exist yet. I mean, I've not. And selling it tickets yet. well as well. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 my agent will phone me up and go, "Oh, well, that's sold out." And I go, "There's no show." <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, there's a lot of hinges on what happens over the next few months. Do you know what I mean? Just looking at my children, going, "Do something funny, man." <laughs> I need it's material. <laughs> So a lot's coming up. And finally, yeah. I know that you're a big Arsenal fan. Mm. I've got to ask you, it's been a good season. Are you lifting that famous trophy? Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I don't think so. Oh, really? I, I, I really think Arsenal have had a great season and I think they're a brilliant team and I think they're very young and I'm very excited about the future of that, of that squad. Um, but Man City are in... That, that Man City are just capable of putting together an incredible run. And listen, I, I don't want to get turned over on social media. I want Arsenal to win. <laughs> yeah. Just carry on that. I, 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 I absolutely <laughs> want Arsenal. right down the camera. Yeah, I want Arsenal. I want <laughs> to be absolutely clip crystal clear. <laughs> yeah, clip it I up. Really, I really want Arsenal to win the league. Right? Because what I don't want to happen is if they do, people go, you didn't want this, did you, Romain? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I want it. Obviously, I really want Particularly it. Particularly on Twitter, that Yeah, happened, but yeah. like, the, like I, I, you know, I mean, I went, to the, I went to the Man City game. Yeah. And... Just Man City, are just yeah. they're just amazing, and they're so good. They're like yeah. one of the best teams we've ever seen, yeah. and I just think they're capable of putting together a run. Even, you know, the Everton game that we won comfortably. Even, yeah. even when it got to like 39, 40 minutes and we hadn't scored yet, you could feel the ground going, "Oh my God, is this where it starts to go?" You know, like there's that pressure. They just yeah. haven't done it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, l listen, I'd love to. I'd love. I sound like Kevin Keegan now. I, I'd, I'd love it. I'd love it. I'd Don't absolutely love it if we won. But I just think City, are, they're just unbelievable. Fair enough. Marv, I agree. Win the league? I, I agree. I think City can, they can literally win every game. No one, yeah. no one would think, oh my God, it's incredible that City won every game. They'd go, okay, they won again. Yeah. Okay, they won again. Mm. Okay, they won again. Oh, they won the league yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be tough. But at the same time, like Arsenal got great, great future they got such a young squad I think they're the youngest squad in the league right I think so, and so yeah. like you know I think at the start of the season if you said to any Arsenal fan top four champ back in the Champions League 100% all day yeah. so like to be in a title race and obviously the players will have this experience to take forward maybe compete next season you know next season after or continue to compete you know what I mean that's I think that's the main thing really yeah and I think it's just nice for me because like my kids have just seen you know, I, I've had to just show them YouTube videos of Thierry Henry. <laughs> Trust me, Arsenal. Over and over again. Like, we're a big deal, guys. <laughs> there are some good YouTube compilations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. Perfect note to end it. Man City. It will be a fascinating title race. It's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds. Uh, big thank you to our guest. First entertainment guest on the pod, Romesh Ranganathan. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks so much.